Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things that everyone needs to know with uh, 2018, with our title of our webinar today being 2019 Industry Outlook, What State Pharmacy Associations and Pharmacy Stakeholders Need to Know. So before we get started, we'll go ahead and talk about Friar Levitt so you can know exactly who is giving you this webinar. Friar Levitt is a national boutique healthcare law firm located in Pinebrook, New Jersey. Our 35 attorneys bring collective experience and backgrounds in pharmacy, hospital administration, professional licensing, attorney general actions, clinical practice, and medical billing. Through our experience in representing thousands of pharmacies across the country, we have developed strong relationships with key decision makers at each pharmacy benefit manager and have successfully fought on behalf of pharmacies and healthcare providers and conducting Medicare appeals. Friar Levitt provides directed and uniquely tailored legal services to specialty pharmacies, including network issues, state and federal any willing provider laws, regulations limiting specialty drug co-payments, and limited distribution drug concerns. Moreover, Friar Levitt also provides comprehensive legal services to our healthcare clients, including corporate and transactional services, regulatory advice, and litigation support. And because this webinar is uh, kind of a, a two for one uh, with Friar Levitt and Friar Levitt Government Affairs, I'll tell you briefly uh, about Friar Levitt Government Affairs as well. Friar Levitt Government Affairs, otherwise known as FLGA, uh, LLC, it's a full service bipartisan government affairs firm, lobbying and strategic consulting firm providing advocacy exclusively for the life science and healthcare sectors. We work with providers, healthcare associations and alliances, manufacturers and wholesalers, providing information and guidance on navigating governmental and political developments, and assist them in building working relationships with legislators and regulators. So with all that background, let me go ahead and introduce you to today's speakers. The first is uh, Jesse Dresser. So we're gonna be kind of tag teaming this this afternoon. Jesse Dresser joined Friar Levitt in 2010, has been with the firm since graduating magna cum laude from Seton Hall University School of Law. Since that time, he has developed a thorough knowledge of state laws as they pertain to, you, to pharmacy practices, insurance billing practices, and PBM regulation. In addition, Jesse routinely lectures to compounding specialty and retail pharmacies regarding a variety of topics, including proper submission of claims to insurance companies, compliant pharmacy and compounding practices, and methods of growing a pharmacy business while avoiding scrutiny for both payers and regulators. Through his experience with pharmacy law team, Jesse has developed an in-depth knowledge of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and is implementing regulations. Jesse has represented numerous clients in connection with audits, network admission efforts, and network terminations. He communicates on behalf of pharmacies with management and general counsel for numerous PBMs and insurance companies. In addition to his work with pharmacy clients, he also represents a variety of other entities, including other healthcare providers, manufacturers, healthcare technology companies, and wholesalers. And through this, Jesse has focused on the intersection between the law and economic considerations, including drug pricing, marketing techniques, and benefit management. He is a partner in the pharmacy law group, but they focus on payer issues and litigation. And I'll be your other speaker. Um, you can see my bio here. I have over 25 years experience on government affairs, including federal, state, and municipal levels of government. 15 years dedicated to healthcare. Um, prior to actually becoming the executive director and head lobbyist here at Friar Levitt Government Affairs, as well as senior counsel at Friar Levitt, um, I founded True North, um, also have uh, a background in wholesale distribution and have worked um, in various other sectors with healthcare customers, including retail specialty pharmacies, home infusion, long-term care, institutional, and HME. So with that being said, I believe it's gonna be time to actually get into our webinar, but before we do so, I did wanna give you all a disclaimer uh, regarding the information that you're going to hear today. The materials and information provided in this presentation are for informational purposes only, and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. The information contained in this presentation is a brief overview and should not be construed as legal advice or exhaustive coverage of the topics. You should contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. 
Statements, opinions, and descriptions contained herein are based on general experience of Friar Levitt attorneys practicing in pharmacy law and are not meant to be relied upon by anyone. Use of and access to this presentation or any materials or information contained within this pr presentation do not create an attorney-client relationship between Friar Levitt or its attorneys and the user or viewer. So now that we have our disclaimer out of the way, we can talk about presentation objectives. So with the November election in the books, the policy environment for pharmacy issues hangs in the balance. Who controls the halls of Congress as well as the state legislatures will be key in determining the pace of pharmacy legislation. Over the last several months, we have seen several positive developments for pharmacy, including clawback legislation, media pressure on PBM transparency, and other industry groups such as NCOIL, otherwise known as the National Council of Insurance Legislators, discuss model PBM legislation. This presentation will focus on the following. We will look at the election aftermath, which will be an examination of state and federal legislative makeups. We will take a look at the pharmacy bills uh, to be enacted, or at least kind of a look back over 2018 so we know exactly where we are uh, and, and where we stand going into 2019. We'll also take a look at some key pharmacy legal decisions, and I know Jesse's going to uh, come on and talk a lot about that. We're going to do our PBM public perception and just kind of look at the history of how um, our narrative surrounding PBMs have transformed from really not knowing a lot about PBMs to where we're now seeing them front and center in the media to where a lot of attention on the PBM activity should be. And lastly, we're going to take a look at how uh, pharmacy stakeholders can maximize legislative and legal resources. So before we actually get into all of that good stuff, let's talk about <clears throat> the election results. Now, the map that you see in front of you was before the November 6th elections, and this is on state. So let me just go through federal really quickly, and then we'll get to the state government stuff, because I know a lot of our clients and uh, just some other interested stakeholders have contacted us asking us a lot about states and what's happened on the state level, because that's really where a lot of the stakeholder priorities seem to be. <clears throat> so as you may have uh, realized, after um, the November 6th elections, at least in the U.S. Uh, Senate, the Republicans have kept their majority in the Senate, and they've increased their seat count to 53. The Republicans have managed to flip North Dakota, Indiana, Missouri, and Florida from Democratic seats uh, to a Republican-held seat. However, in the House, the Democrats fare better by flipping the House of Representatives to their control. As of today, they have gained 39 seats with one district that is still too close to call. That district is within California's 21st district, and that right now has Democrat T.J. Cox uh, with a very, very slight lead over the incumbent Republican uh, Representative David Valadeo. And it would give Democrats a 40-seat gain in the House if this race continues as it is. So the map that you see in front of you, um, this is a, a list of states that actually had, uh, they were, you'll see the red, those were, Republican controlled, and then you see Alaska. So what really happened in the midterm elections is that there were six latest legislative chambers that actually flipped from Republican to Democrat. And you can see the before and after on this next slide. So Colorado Senate was controlled by the Republicans. It now flipped to Democrat. The Connecticut Senate was actually tied, um, but now it flipped to Democrat. The New Hampshire House went from Republican to Democrat. The New Hampshire Senate went from Republican to Democrat. The Minnesota House went from Republican to Democrat. The Maine Senate went Republican to Democrat. The New York Senate went from Republican to Democrat. And the Alaska House went from Democrat to Republican. Now, I've got a couple of asterisks by New York and Alaska. So for New York, Democrats had won the New York Senate. And while it was a numerically Democratic chamber, a Republican-led coalition held power prior to the midterm election, and that is no longer the case. In Alaska, there was a small renegade group of Republicans that had allied with the Democrats to actually lead the chamber, and after the midterm elections, that is no longer the case as well. 
So let's take a look at post elections on the state level uh, after November 6. So you can see the Republican states are in red, the Democrats are in blue, uh, the black of, of uh, Nebraska is a unicameral uh, house, so they don't really have two houses, they only have one and everyone is a state senator with no political affiliations, which I think is a really interesting state. Uh, there are split controls, so uh, Montana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Kansas, and Louisiana all have split control. One party either controls the governor's uh, gubernatorial seat or the legislature themselves. That's why we have them in purple. So what does this actually mean with all these uh, people flipping seats and control being changed uh, here from the midterms? Well, let's take a look just kind of from a, a national perspective and see just what kind of policy are we talking about? Well, from what we've gathered internally, um, it seems that for several stakeholders, Medicaid is very important. So taking a look at Medicaid policy during the election in Idaho, Nebraska, and Utah, Voters actually approved ballot initiatives to expand Medicaid coverage, while in Montana, voters rejected a ballot measure to remove the sunset date for the current Medicaid expansion that was tied to a tobacco tax increase. Now, with Democrats in control of the House, this will likely mean there will be less of a threat to repealing the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA, as well as less of a threat to further reductions in Medicaid. However, this does not mean that Medicaid funding is completely out of the woods. Republicans will likely try and introduce additional measures, likely in the Senate, such as proposing block grant legislation aimed at reducing Medicaid funding. And we've seen a little bit of that uh, starting uh, just shortly after the new administration came into power, where HHS talked a lot about using block grants to try to shift some of the risk from the federal uh, government onto the states. And their justification was, uh, you know, most state governors and legislatures, they know what's best for their uh, individual constituents and we wanna give them that control back. The other thing that could possibly happen um, is an introduction of possible action by the administration via HHS to create additional 1115 or 1332 waiver opportunities. And these different waiver programs are going to be very key going forward to try to figure out how Medicaid and the ACA are going to be shaped. So if your Medicaid population has changed and you want to write HHS to have some kind of deviation from your prior plan, you would submit an 1115 waiver. However, if we're talking about the ACA and there's some requirements on your exchanges that you want to make or anything related to the Affordable Care Act, and you want to submit HHS uh, a change to that particular agency, the state would submit a 1332 waiver. So really trying to look at those particular waivers, the 1115 and the 1332, if you're trying to get some kind of insight as to where your policymakers, such as the governor, is going to go, I would suggest taking a look at what your state has applied through those particular waivers. So, Ron, uh, a question. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about what, sorts of steps or tools or strategies state pharmacy associations or different groups might be able to employ in light of the, the changes regarding um, block grants or, uh, or the waivers? Yeah, well, definitely the block grants are going to be interesting because when you're dealing with block grants, that means just you're dealing with a finite set of money, right? So usually the way it's worked is that Medicaid has been kind of like a rolling blank check. So if something happens, they usually submit an 1115 waiver, they being the governors, and they say, we need more money for this population, such as hepatitis C or, or whatnot. Uh, and what the administration is saying is that they want to stop this kind of rolling uh, blank check and move more towards a block grant if they get the votes to do that. Uh, but they just haven't really had the votes to do that with the ACA. So if I'm a state pharmacy executive or, or uh, you know, a, a pharmacy itself or any kind of a, of a stakeholder, I would really want to pay attention to um, if my particular state had maybe a heavy hepatitis C uh, population and you know, you, know, you know that you need more money to go towards that, then I would encourage policymakers to see if they could work with them to figure out if there is a way they can identify some opportunities within the 1115 waiver. 
With regards to the 1332 waiver, if it's a pharmacy uh, association or any kind of a pharmacy stakeholder, a lot of pharmacies rely on the Medicaid program for uh, their beneficiaries. So maybe there is a way after looking at your particular state makeup, uh, after examining your data, because it's going to be very key to understand what type of data uh, that you have out there so you can you know, not only improve adherence, but understand exactly who's coming to your pharmacy. You can get better numbers, make yourself more valuable to the insurance networks. You can, again, work with your policymakers to put in better policy that's going to uh, help your 1332 population. And if you're not really sure exactly how to do that, we can definitely help you. Does that answer your question, Jesse? Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Other issues that we do foresee on the legislative front going into 2019, we do expect drug pricing, the opiate crisis, transparency around the 340B program, as well as greater generic prescription drug utilization to be issues that we believe would be a witness to bipartisan legislative cooperation or cooperation in 2019. Now, we've been telling folks, including clients, prospective clients, that state government is where your opportunities to both preserve your reimbursement and also expand your market share could be. And uh, with all the new faces in the state legislature this year, we can definitely help you identify these opportunities. But as Jesse alluded to in his question, I think that those particular waivers, the 1115 and the 1332, are going to be ones that you do want to pay attention to to see if you can actually take advantage of that. So uh, while this webinar is definitely focused on retail pharmacy, I do want to take a look at the 2018 legislative wins for pharmacy. And we have compiled this through our own research as well as uh, some really key assistance from NCPA. And we've come up with these uh, statistics. So you can see on this slide here uh, what's been the most uh, versus what's been the least. And what's been the most this year in state legislatures has been things focused on state provider status for pharmacy. Also, transparency and disclosure has been up there. Definitely gag clauses and copay clawbacks. And then the other ones that you see that did get some attention, but not as much as those other four, PBM registration slash licensure, fair pharmacy audits, pharmacy patient protections, and Medicare synchronization. And before I go into a little bit more about what was passed, Jesse, did you have anything to add to this? So one of the things that would be helpful, Ron, is you might be able to comment on why you think that some of these gained the traction that they did. You know, I have, I have my theories as well, but I'd be interested to hear your commentary on why some of these we're seeing so many more states just kind of rolling through and, and implementing some of these requirements. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that all of these, I mean, you know, as, tr as far as trying to find the right bill or, you know, did your state get the right subject matter addressed in 2018? I don't really think that's the question. I think that with so much attention on gag clauses, because, you know, and I know this myself because I've actually uh, drafted some uh, DIR slash uh, clawback language, and it was really difficult to really go after DIR because that's a federal issue. Um, and I do know one thing that if any of you um, are, are planning on going in front of your legislatures uh, to talk about DIR or to talk about clawbacks, you really should be prepared to bring your data because they are going to ask you exactly how their uh, respective constituents are being impacted by clawbacks and DIR. But at least with the gag clauses, because one of the um, strategies that I employed was really moving it away, well, not really away, but putting in conjunction how this is hurting the pharmacy to have this gag clause here, but it's also hurting the consumer, because not only are they paying the higher copay, but they're not able to have that uh, conversation with the pharmacy on how to save money and to see if there's any kind of alternative medication that they could take. So definitely with that, the gag clauses, and the copay clawbacks, I think, would be the reasons for such a huge um, um, shift towards wanting that legislation. So that's why you see the higher number there. Also, the state provider status. You know, reimbursement, it's getting shrunk, obviously, by the payers. So pharmacies are looking for a lot more ways to shift from what they're being commoditized as. And it's really unfair because that's not what a pharmacist is. They're not, you know, just counting pills or doing other valuable services, but it's also time for pharmacy to get paid for these particular uh, different types of consultation, just like every other profession does. You know, physicians, nurses, pharmacists should be paid. So that's why you see a higher number with those three. Transparency and disclosure is a little bit more general, 
um, you know, that could really include Mac, um, you know, licensure, that kind of a thing too. So it really depends on how that bill is structured. But I think as far as the three highest, that's those are the reasons why. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you, Ron. No problem. So let's take a look a little bit more into some of the bills. So provider status, and you see again from that uh, slide, uh, we've got about 15 pieces of legislation that were enacted. Uh, some of the things that caught my eye were uh, under immunizations. This is still under provider status, so there was like different levels of it. Mississippi, Senate Bill uh, 2836, Missouri, Iowa, New York, they all expanded pharmacist authority to administer immunizations. Naloxone was a huge, uh, well, actually three states uh, targeted naloxone under scope of practice. And all three of these bills really did the same thing. They allowed pharmacists to prescribe and dispense naloxone, which is you know, something that's very needed uh, in a real-time situation like that. Now, one thing, one thing I'll, I'll just put out there um, on the naloxone piece, this has obviously become an issue of extreme national importance with the opioid epidemic and the role that pharmacies play in combating it. And one of the things that we are seeing is becoming more and more important is for providers to have policies in place on dispensing naloxone, on standing orders for naloxone, and, and on dealing with this. And so this is one of the areas that as pharmacy associations or as large groups that, that service a large number of pharmacy providers, this is an area that's ripe for assisting your membership in helping them make sure that they have the right policies and procedures in place and the right tools that are going to help them move forward in this new paradigm that we're in. Couldn't agree more. Contraception is another issue that I saw that was under the scope of practice here, especially in Utah, D.C., and New Hampshire. In Utah, the law allows a pharmacist to dispense self-administered hormonal conception or contraceptives under a standing order. In D.C., pharmacists can prescribe and dispense certain contraceptives. And in New Hampshire this year, pharmacists can dispense hormonal contraceptives under a standing order from a physician. Also under provider status, there were two states, Colorado and D.C., that we wanted to mention regarding compensation of services. In Colorado, the new law mandates compensation for pharmacies administering injectable medication-assisted therapy for substance use disorders under a collaborative practice agreement. And insurance plans can cover services that are given by a pharmacist in health professional shortages. In Washington, D.C., the new law requires insurers for Medicaid and the D.C. Healthcare Alliance to cover pharmacy services for certain contraceptives, contraceptives as well. Some interesting ones to note, Idaho, pharmacists can perform therapeutic substitutions under certain conditions. In Kentucky this year, there's a pilot program to create community pharmacy care delivery model for medication-assisted therapy for substance use disorder. And lastly, in Maryland, pharmacists can fill up to a 90-day supply of medication. So these are just some ideas that you guys can get that's for scope of, or, uh, provider status. There's different elements within it. So scope of practice, like a specialization of services. These are different ways to try to get things that you want. We also saw uh, some transparency. So mostly MAC legislation, updating the MAC list, such as in Arkansas, which is really interesting. In Arkansas, the insurance commissioner can review and approve a PBM's compensation program to ensure fair reimbursement for pharmacies. So I know that's something that everyone on this call um, is really interested in. In Georgia, PBMs must disclose pharmacy claim information and Medicaid and state health, health benefit plans. Louisiana is very similar to Georgia. South Carolina now requires PBMs to disclose pharmacy claim information and Medicaid and other state health plans. And in Virginia, it's very similar in that plan sponsors must disclose information on Medicaid pharmacy claims. We've also seen uh, some accreditation certification. We see Medicaid synchronization. And then as we talked about earlier, gag clauses and copay uh, clawbacks were some of the larger ones that we saw. So now that we kind of have a snapshot of some of the bills that were enacted, and obviously we can take more questions in the end, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jesse, really quick to talk about some of the legal decisions that were key this year.
So in terms of legal decisions, we sought to include some very recent ones, but, but also some that some of the more recent ones are, are premised on. So the first one I have on here is Pharmaceutical Care Management Association v. Tuff. Uh, that's the recent case out of North Dakota. But before I talk about that one, I want to talk about the other two that are listed right underneath it, the PCMA versus Gerhardt and PCMA versus Rutledge. So as everyone is, is likely aware, PCMA, Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, is the trade organization for the PBM industry. And they are very, very active. They are involved in not only monitoring the developments within the legislature and, and the regulatory agencies, but more importantly, taking action based on that. And so many of these cases are here because PCMA has stepped in as a plaintiff to challenge laws that are passed by legislatures. And so you imagine as a state association, state pharmacy association, and you are using your political capital, a term Ron likes to use, to push for legislation that's going to help your membership, only to find that a month and a half after it's signed by the governor, you see a lawsuit that pops up naming the naming the insurance commissioner and, and the, rec the underlying people within the state to challenge the enforcement of that law. You know, the, the last thing you want to see happen is all that, that hard work go for naught because PCMA has challenged it on some grounds such as preemption or some grounds such as uh, it being unenforceable or unconstitutional. So in North Dakota, North Dakota had passed a sweeping pharmacy law that many feared would be overturned uh, based on a ruling of preemption. So the reason that people had feared that it would be overturned is North, North Dakota is in the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit is a court of appeals circuit that encompasses a number of states, including North Dakota. There were two cases that had come out of the Eighth Circuit, PCMA versus Gerhardt and PCMA versus Rutledge. PCMA versus Gerhardt stemmed from an Iowa law where the Iowa legislature had passed a MAC law imposing certain requirements on PBMs operating in that state that wanted to have MAC lists. They had attempted to explicitly carve out self-funded ERISA plans in the definition of their, quote, covered entities, but this was deemed by the Eighth Circuit to be an impermissible, quote, reference to ERISA plans. Now, now reference to is parlance within the preemption doctrine as to whether or not a law can or cannot sustain a preemption challenge under ERISA. If it, if it makes specific or implicit reference to an ERISA plan, it could cause the statute to be preempted. The court also found that the Iowa law interfered with the structure and administration of ERISA plans in Iowa and required administrative processes unique to that state including the requirement to report to the commissioner and to network pharmacies of methodologies used for establishing MAC reimbursement amounts, restricting the class of drugs to which PBMs could establish MAC prices for and the sources they could use to establish that MAC pricing information, and requiring PBMs to allow for MAC uh, appeals. Pretty straightforward things within a MAC law, but the Eighth Circuit found, because of the drafting of the statute, that they uh, related to and interfered with administration of ERISA plans and therefore were preempted. What was concerning about this case is not only did it revor reverse the lower court's holding, because the lower court had found that the law was not preempted, but it directed judgment in favor of PCMA. You know, it, it cut right to the chase and, and gave PCMA the, the win. <clears throat> Likewise, came out a, a little while later was uh, PCMA versus Rutledge. And, and here, Guided by the Gerhardt decision, the Eighth Circuit again found that Arkansas's MAC law was preempted as well. Here, the court stated that where the law both relates to and has a connection with employee benefit plans, the presumption against preemption is gone and the law is preempted. So they did a very, very similar analysis using the exact same reasoning that was found in the Gerhardt case and, and made the exact same determination under ERISA as to the Arkansas MAC appeal law. What was also somewhat concerning is in addition to finding that the law was that the Arkansas state law was preempted under ERISA, the 
Eighth Circuit found that the MAC law was also preempted by Medicare Part D and the implementing laws because it acted with respect to, and, and that's, that's quotes, with respect to the Medicare Part D negotiated price standard and the Medicare Part D pharmacy access standard. And that's in Medicare Part D parlance, in determining whether a law is preempted by Medicare Part D laws, it has to act with respect to certain standards set forth within the Medicare Part D construct. And here, the court had found that the MAC law, as written, impinged on the negotiated price definition and standard contained within the within Title 42 of the U.S. Code, as well as the pharmacy access standard. And, and the reason being, as it relates to the pharmacy access standard, is the Arkansas's MAC law had given pharmacies the option to decline to fill a particular drug if it was going to re be reimbursed below water based on that MAC price. And, and it was determined that because of that, it would impact the ability to ensure a reasonable access to pharmacies. And so for that reason, it was also deemed to be preempted based on, on that issue, on the Medicare Part D issue as well. But then turning back to the Pharmaceutical uh, Care Management Association be tough, the North, Care, uh, North Dakota decision that came out uh, beginning of this fall in, in September. So North Dakota passed legislation that contained provisions concerning the practice of pharmacy, pharmacy accreditation and credentialing, and perceived self-dealing and abusive practices on the part of PBMs. PCMA again challenged the laws on the basis of preemption, uh, both from ERISA standpoint and from Medicare Part D standpoint. They argued that the laws contained implicit references to ERISA because within each of the, the sections of law, it contained the terms pharmacy benefit manager, third party payer, and plan sponsor. And in the definition section of the laws, they were defined broadly enough to implicate ERISA health plans. What was notable is the requirements of North Dakota's laws are largely incumbent upon pharmacies and pharmacies' rights and responsibilities. And unlike the laws in Arkansas and Iowa, didn't impose the same levels of significant requirements on the PBMs, especially in, re in relation to plan operation, such that they could have related to or directly impacted ERISA plans. Instead, the court here, and, and what's important to note is the court in the North Dakota case was a district court. It was not the Eighth Circuit. It was the district court. The judge found that the any impact on ERISA plans would have been too attenuated and too far removed toward preemption. Again, because PCMA's argument was by virtue of defining third-party benefit, third-party third administrator and PBM in such a broad stroke that it could theoretically encompass ERISA plans, that was too attenuated because, again, the focus of the laws was on pharmacy practice. You know, giving pharmacies the right to disclose prices to patients, giving pharmacies the right to disclose uh, rates to plan sponsors, giving pharmacies the right to dispense any drug that they have the right to dispense under state law, giving pharmacies, creating prohibitions on, on imposing new requirements above and beyond that which was required by state law to practice as a pharmacy. Those were those were the, the main thrusts of that statute, and, and clearly, they don't have the same plan design impact on plan design or impact on plan costs that a rule that that impact directly impacted prices or directly impacted the the ability to challenge prices might otherwise have and so what was very interesting from from that perspective is that the court focused on that in the wake of Gerhardt and in the wake of the Rutledge case and and navigated around those to find that this law wasn't preempted. They also did an analysis under Medicare Part D, finding that Part D preemption occurs only when CMS actually creates standards in the area to be regulated. And to the extent that CMS doesn't create any standards whatsoever, preemption can't be warranted. And so the court concluded that the Medicare non-interference clause, the, the section of the Medicare laws that PCMA was arguing prohibited any form of state regulation of plans wasn't impacted because it couldn't possibly be construed to bar all form of state regulation of PBM contracts. And so, again, th this was a, a pretty seminal decision because it was in the it was out of the Eighth Circuit. It was in the wake of these two cases, and 
found a, a different path. You know, recognized the existence of the precedent set by these two cases, but found a different path uh, to to make the determination that it was not preempted. It's a pretty well reasoned opinion too. So we'll see how it goes when when PCMA challenges it up to the Eighth Circuit. But it certainly creates a a logical explanation as to why this law that is more pharmacy centric as opposed to PBM centric might uh, withstand a, a preemption challenge even on appeal. The other case that recently came out, and this is not as well known, um, is a interim decision in the public litigation battle between CareZone, a, a pharmacy, and Express Scripts. So CareZone is, is a pharmacy. They have locations in a couple areas, including Tennessee. They had filed an action against Express Scripts seeking a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction on the basis of Tennessee's Any Willing Provider Law, contending that they'd willingly accepted the terms offered by Express Scripts, but that ESI had nevertheless terminated the pharmacy on pretextual claims of breach of the, of the provider agreement, uh, ostensibly related to mailing and, and other minor issues. So what was important to note is that this case was initially brought on a emergent TRO basis, temporary restraining order basis. So there's a heightened standard for TROs. And on this heightened standard, the court fortunately found that it was far from clear that Express Scripts was a, quote, health insurance or coverage issuer, quote, within the purview of Tennessee's Any Willing Provider Law, and as a result, denied the application for immediate emergent restraints. The court found that the statute didn't define, quote, health insurance issuer, and that the parties had not identified any Tennessee court decisions or, or other laws that had treated PBMs as being subject to the a AWP, and suggesting that other courts had typically concluded that PBMs were not health insurers, but rather third-party health plan administrators, which manage and administer prescription drug benefits on behalf of health insurance plans. So, here, CareZone had argued that Tennessee treated PBMs as insurers for any willing provider purposes and pointed to other code sections of Tennessee law, which interestingly did define health insurance issuers to include PBMs, explicitly defined it in such a way that PBMs were swept within that definition. But, you know, fortunately, the court found that because these definitions were not the same part of the code section as the any willing provider law, Going back to the rules of statutory interpretation, they found that the Tennessee legislator expressly included PBMs in one section of the code, but not in the other, and that this actually weighed against CareZone's arguments that the fact that the legislator included PBMs in the definition of health insurance issuer in one section, but not in the AWP, ran and f flew in the face of their argument. So, so it, it kind of goes, it really highlights the importance of ensuring consistent and expansive definitions when drafting legislation and highlights the importance of getting sound advisory opinions from attorney general's offices on these issues, interpreting these statutes. You know, otherwise what winds up happening is, is this case kind of stands for the paradox that gets created that's, that's designed and, and ultimately exploited by the PBMs. You know, on the one hand, they argue that they aren't subject to the any willing provider laws because they aren't health insurance companies. But at the same time, for pharmacies, there's, there's little standing or contractual basis for them to sue the plan sponsors, you know, the, the health care issuers, uh, because they don't have a contract. And so it's, it's this paradox, this, this legal twilight zone, so to speak, that, that PBMs know they've, they've arguably had a hand in creating and, and are exploiting. And so one of the, the big opportunities for associations, and, and this, this is evidence in a couple other cases I'll talk about, but one of the big opportunities for associations is to identify these issues with any willing provider laws and come up with solutions, make sure that they are drafted in such a way that, that navigates the, the issues of ERISA and, and, and uh, Medicare Part D preemption, but at the same time have enough definition and have enough clarity and, and teeth to them to give providers the ability to, to indicate that, they, that PBMs are bound by these statutes because the, the Part D plan, the, the health uh, plan sponsors, the health insurance companies, they, they're not on the front lines determining who's in and who's out of the network. It's the PBMs, but the PBMs disclaim all liability under the law because they're not health insurance companies. So simple drafting fixes can help address some of those issues. 
Um, and this was borne out in, in another case. I, I don't have it on the slide, but it's, it was a recent case from, from last year, uh, Park Ermat drug versus Express Scripts as well. And here, what was interesting is Park Ermat had explicitly contracted as a mail order pharmacy. They were clear on their provider certification that they were doing predominantly mail and Express Scripts had approved them into the network. And based on that, that certification that they were doing primarily mail and based on you know, the written approval and, and acceptance into the network, they made substantial investments into their mail order business. They hired employees. They built a multi-million dollar facility. They obtained industry accreditations and, and really relied on it. And then about a year later, Express Scripts sent a cease and desist letter for mailing in violation, you know, ostensibly in violation of the retail contract. And while Ermat was appealing this decision, Express Scripts terminated Ermat without cause and also for cause based on the mailing of the prescriptions. And this is an important concept for uh, pharmacies is this, this idea that they can be terminated with or without cause. So Ermat had sued under a variety of theories, including antitrust, breach of contract, breach of applied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, and, and specific violations of state and e-willing provider laws, specifically Georgia, Mississippi, and North Carolina. The court dismissed the entire case, but especially dismissed the counts relating to any willing provider, finding that, again, a PBM was not a, quote, health benefit plan subject to those three states' any willing provider laws, and that the role of Express Scripts in administering pharmacy benefits for third parties did not come within the reach of any of the three statutes at issue. So again, this highlights the importance of crafting these expansive definitions in any willing provider law such that they do explicitly include PBMs so that PBMs are swept within that definition. Um, as a, as a post, interesting postscript to this case, uh, this past month, Ermat actually petitioned the court to revive its antitrust and breach of contract suit um, against Express Scripts on the basis that uh, Express Scripts had reversed its policy against allowing or doing business with mail order providers. You know, in fact, they, had, um, they have since come out with a new network for pharmacies seeking to do mail order services in order to, quote, keep in line with the needs of their clients. And so this case is currently on appeal before the Eighth Circuit. And this is, this is kind of one of those interesting kind of turns of events that, have, that has happened in, in the past uh, couple of weeks based on uh, Express Scripts conduct. The last case I do want to touch briefly on, because this highlights another concept, and that's the, the concept of a private right of action. And so this is the case Primade versus Express Scripts. It was out of New Jersey. Primade was a specialty pharmacy in New Jersey that had been terminated from Humana's networks on a it was ostensibly a pretextual basis. And when the pharmacy was eligible for readmission to the PBM's network, the PBM denied its application. So they, they filed suit. And because they didn't have a contract in place, you know, they'd been, they'd been terminated and, and they were trying to get a contract, they, they sued and, and the court found that there was no private right of action, uh, private cause of action under the state's any willing provider laws and ended up dismissing the entire case with prejudice, finding that the any willing provider statute does not expressly provide for a private cause of action and the court would not imply one. This is a finding that has come down in a lot of different cases that if a state statute does not include an explicit private right of action, many times the court won't imply one and, and the only entity, the only actor left to enforce that statute is essentially the state attorney general. And it, it was also interesting that the court dismissed the antitrust claims as well, finding that a PBM couldn't be liable under antitrust laws for enforcing and I quote, a transparent contract freely agreed in freely agreed to in a competitive market. So, you know, it, it kind of signals the leeriness courts have towards or, or and, and arguably the, the lack of connection with reality some courts have with regard to what are the, the realities of the contracting marketplace for uh, pharmacies and PBMs. You know, this idea that there's a transparent contract freely agreed to and negotiated in a, com in a competitive market is just completely divorced from reality. But again, this case really highlights the importance of including private rights of action, you know, explicit statutory private rights of action into any willing provider laws. And there are a handful of states that have it. 
And, and two, encouraging regulators like insurance commissioners and attorney generals, boards of pharmacy to take action and to exercise their enforcement powers um, in instances where the law doesn't include a private right of action. And, and this is something that we've assisted folks in doing in going to these regulators and going to these, these agencies, presenting the facts almost as if it's a, a, a mini trial and working to try to compel some form of regulatory action. Because at the end of the day, the PBMs aren't going to be able to, to contend, particularly in, in many of these states that now require PBM licensure, that there isn't jurisdiction by a lot of these state agencies to, to regulate them. And so those are, those are a couple of the big key legal decisions that, that impact not only pharmacies, but, but also have a help shape strategy and help shape decision making by pharmacy associations and other groups, you know, such as GPOs or buying groups or, or other groups of pharmacies that that are looking to shape things for the better for their membership and, and, and use some political capital to either effectuate regulatory change, legislative change, or, or otherwise advocate on behalf of their members. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ron, who we can get into a little bit of the changing uh, norms and, and, uh, and views on PBMs in, in the marketplace. Sounds good. And before I go into this uh, slide very quickly, because I do understand the time, um, I know one thing that you mentioned, Jesse, was the NA willing provider. And that's one thing that I do want to make sure that people on this call are aware of, that just because you're any, or your state has an NA willing provider's law or statute, uh, it may or may not mean that you as a pharmacy or pharmacist are covered. So that's one thing that you want to make sure that you understand if you are or if you're not. Uh, before you start making any decisions about anything. And if you're unsure, you should always ask. Um, but one thing I do want to ask you, Jesse, with all those law cases that you went through, I know states want to mimic successes of other states. So if I'm a state pharmacy association or any kind of pharmacy um, stakeholder, um, is there something wrong with Arkansas? Should I look to North Dakota? Should I try to, like, how would I do that with some of the things that you mentioned with those particular cases? So with those cases, you know, it really comes down to the fact that, that North Dakota's law that was being challenged was different. It was just different than um, Arkansas's law or Iowa's law. Arkansas's and Iowa's law focused primarily on different variations of MAC appeals. You know, one regulating how and under what circumstances a PBM could establish a MAC list, but two what the process would be to, ch to be able to challenge below water reimbursement on MAC drugs. And so one of the challenges that I think is, is going to continue is how to draft some of these rules that, that do these laws that do have uh, you know, an impact on pr drug pricing, that do have an impact on plan administration, but to do it in such a way that, that doesn't run afoul or doesn't, doesn't loop in preemption, particularly when there is a difference of opinion when you go to different circuits. You know, all these, all these cases are coming out of the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit has been, has been very hands-on in, in this regard, but, but other circuits you know, might, not have the, might not come down the same way. And so what it means is there has to be a very, very clear strategy that takes into account the jurisdiction that you're in to draft a law that's going to put you in the best possible position to avoid facing one of these types of preemption. Sounds good. So I just wanted to trace, um, I do know that we've been watching PBMs for a long time and not just meaning Friar Levitt. I mean, all of you out there, all of you pharmacy association execs, stakeholders, you know PBMs have been a problem for years. It's just been, does everyone else catch up to seeing what we see? So uh, we started just kind of tracing some of the things that we saw recently, just so you guys are aware. And PBS uh, ran a very interesting video, August 2017, outlining what a PBM is. It was titled, Little Known Middlemen Save Money on Medicines, But Maybe Not For You. So that was encouraging to see. What was also encouraging, and I'll give a shout out to our friends at OPA, the Ohio Pharmacists Association, Ernie and Antonio, uh, their work of just getting, you know, just hearing the pharmacy's frustration about PBM and channeling that over to the Columbus Dispatch uh, and what ended up happening was a series of investigative reports on PBMs with one of the major ones titled Side Effects and Ongoing Investigation on the Rising Cost of Prescription Drugs. That led to a major change in Ohio. 
to where they are no longer doing spread pricing. They are now a pass-through model. And how they did that was that they, uh, the Ohio auditor's report, uh, his name is David Yost. It was presented to the Joint Medicaid Oversight Committee in Ohio. And it was at the direction of the legislature to find out more about these PBMs. And some of the highlights of the auditor's report are the following. They found the difference between what pharmacies are paid and what pharmacy benefit managers report back to the plans, commonly referred to as the spread, has been growing and hit its peak in fourth quarter of 2017. They found an overwhelming portion of PBM spreads is occurring on generic prices. Spread pricing totals wildly varied from region to region. There's a disconnect between Medicaid pharmacy costs and what pharmacies are reimbursed. The data that they saw confirmed a high number of pharmacy closures amid reimbursement cuts. And I know that I'm seeing that with some of our clients that we're dealing with. And I know that you folks that are attending this webinar know that all too well. The spread totals were highest on specialty drugs, which are typically dispensed at PBM owned pharmacies. The analysis stressed the need to look beyond the spread to see if there was any other nuggets of information we could find. And then the report concluded with further study is needed on these other issues. We've also seen more PBM stories on rebates, including how there should be no more rebates, not to mention the Trump blueprint that was released early this spring, which mentioned PBM impacts on the system, as well as advocated against gag clauses, which led to the uh, two enacted laws on gag clauses that we saw. So with that being said, I'm going to move into the final portion of our presentation here. Ashley, Jesse, if you want to talk really quick about the regulatory temperature that you see. So we wanted to include this slide because one of the things that's always important for organizations and associations to be aware of is, is what we call the regulatory temperature. You know, that's that's where we get the sense in, in our dealings with the different regulatory bodies, the different agencies, and different ultimately people within those agencies, what their temperature is, what their what their appetite is for stepping in and, and taking some kind of action. And so, you know, with respect to CMS and the non-interference clause, this has been an area that with the with a couple unique exceptions, they've been very, very scared of. CMS has been very, very skittish about running afoul of the non-interference clause and, and very deferential to this idea that the non-interference clause prohibits them from, from really doing their legislative, their, their regulatory prerogative. Um, there have been a couple, like I said, there have been a couple examples where they've put out proposed rules that, that you know, in 2014, for example, that, that really parsed the language of the non-interference clause in a way that really made a lot of sense and, and, and suggested that, yeah, they can't be out there doing collective bargaining for drug prices, but that doesn't mean that they can't regulate the relationship between a Part D plan sponsor and a PBM or, or a pharmacy and a Part D plan sponsor or a pharmacy and a PBM or a PBM and a manufacturer or a pharmacy manufacturer. There, there are aspects of that. They just can't be interfering and in, in collectively bargaining for the price. They backed away, you know, based on challenge from the PBM industry. They've backed away from that and, and they continue to be skittish based on that challenge. So there's a lot of opportunity to, and we could talk about some of the strategies, but a lot of opportunity to influence that decision making, to give them the footing to be able to say, I do have the right, I do have the ability to step into this fight a little bit, particularly when it comes to things that they really don't have anything to do with pricing, but rather have, it, have things to do with overall compliance with legislative requirements. For example, the any willing to provide law, making sure that a PBM is not arbitrarily blocking pharmacies from its networks. You know, that's a, that's a perfect example. Um, a, another concept is more and more states are uh, starting to increase their appetite and their temperature for wanting to demand different types of concessions from PBMs, you know, whether this be at a Medicaid level, whether this be in, in terms of um, some of the, the recent examples uh, with CVS and Aetna, for example, where in order to approve that transaction, the uh, Georgia uh, Department of Insurance essentially demanded certain concessions that were, that were the wish list by the Pharmacy Association to um, approve that merger. Um, the other thing that we're starting to see is issues where we get a state regulator on the line. 
and work through some of those issues with the state regulator. Make it clear to that regulator the the violations that the PBM is doing. You know, that they simply aren't following the law. And we've seen a, a, a and Ron can comment a little bit on this too, but we've seen a pretty large variation in terms of different states' temperature to take some kind of action. You know, for example, in some states, the more junior people within the the agency will say, oh, this is a clear-cut case where they've, they've breached the rules. It certainly should take action, but, you know, it's my boss's call, and, and lo and behold, the, the commissioner of insurance recognizes that as a result of the election, is going to be out of a job in three months and is uh, looking to go back into the private sector, go to work for the insurance company. And so even though it's clear that, that the PBM is bre breaching the law, they're not going to take action because they are, you know, they don't want to step on the toes of the industry that's going to employ them. It's kind of revolving door concept. And so one of the things that we would, we would counsel on a regular basis is organizations to ensure that they're constantly monitoring the temperature of the different agencies and the different uh, different regulators. Sounds good. So what can you do um, basically uh, as a state regulatory or I mean a state association or um, uh, an interested stakeholder in pharmacy? We definitely have some tools to help. Uh, so if you're looking at policy, legislative, regulatory, some state federal consultation, Friar Lovett Government Affairs can definitely help you. We have a lot of different tools depending on how you want us to act. We can act state. We can act on the federal level. We could do ca political capital audits to make sure if you're actually giving contributions to a particular legislator, is it actually paying off for you? If you're looking for ways to make sure that your legislation is okay, we have a bill check service. We also do regulatory comments, we do super PAC formations, and we definitely do uh, prepping for the Hill. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jesse to talk about some of the aspects that Friar Levitt Law does, and we will be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so I know we're, we're a little short on time, so I'll, I'll just kind of run through some of these quickly. So, you know, White Papers is a, is a very, very powerful tool. It's, it's got a tremendous opportunity to, to one, really drill down on a particular issue, provide legal and factual support and and use that to help influence policy decision and not only does it stir up media attention of an issue but also gives legislators or regulators footing to take certain types of action another concept is this concept of associational standing this is another thing um, that we have we've employed on behalf of different organizations to challenge a particular uh particular policy or particular conduct. This is exactly what PCMA does every time they sue one of these states over these new laws. But there's also opportunity to take action to compel an agency to do their job. You know, if CMS is not entering the fray, if they are not, if they're not enforcing Medicare rules, an association can step up and, and work to compel them. And then there's this concept of 58 state surveys and gap analyses. These are very, very helpful to uh, to practice to organizations to help ensure that their membership are aware of the different laws and the different rules and, and frankly different opportunities in the different states. But also through gap analysis, you know, if you are a state pharmacy association and you are looking at the rules in your state. It, it basically helps benchmark you against your peers, help take a. a clear cut a, a in-depth look at where your state stacks up and where your laws stack up versus the collective laws of all the other states and seeing what runway you still have left, what what opportunities you still have left to effectuate change for the better. So with that, you know, that's that's the conclusion of our presentation. I, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Um, well, from what I hear, Jesse, um, I believe that there are no questions right now, and I'm going to attribute that to the fact that we did such an in-depth job at uh, telling everyone that what was going on. But uh, for those that have to go or you do have questions or if you just simply want to think about all this information, because we did present you with a lot of information today, but we wanted to tell you some of the, you know, the where we are right now in 2018. So if you think about a couple of things after hours or, you know, 30 minutes after this, just give us a call. Here is our contact information. We're both available by phone or email. And uh, that's pretty much all I can say, Jesse, unless you had anything to add. I thank you all for, for joining us for the past hour.
Sounds good. And uh, again, don't uh, be a stranger. If you have questions, please let us know. And uh, thank you very much for your time and attendance.